Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Well, what do you think is one goal of every entrepreneurial endeavor? Well, uh, besides surviving, I would say (laughs) to grow more than anything else, right? So to scale your business? Yes, that's the way entrepreneurs say it. They say scale your business, (laughs) which means grow. Right. So if you hear somebody say that, that's what it means. But then there's ways to do that and ways that not to do that. So (laughs) I'm just wondering if there are secrets or places you can go to meet people who can help you. Because like meeting the right people and having the right relationships helps with every business. So funny you should bring that up. Our guest tonight is Judith Sheff, who's the Associate Vice President of Strategic Relationships and External Affairs of New Jersey's Innovation Institute, which is an NJIT corporation. And also she's the chairwoman of the Greater Newark Enterprises Corporation. Welcome, Judith. You are an expert at scaling businesses. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Elizabeth, for having me on the iHeartRadio Passage to Profit show. We've done a lot of work with entrepreneurs helping them scale and grow their businesses. And a couple of the comments you made early on in the introduction are really so valuable to entrepreneurs. It's the connections that you make. And in fact, we run a particular program called Health IT Connections. And we've run this program for five years. We've received some support from the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation through a program that they have called Small Business Forward, where we bring companies together in cohort clusters to help them grow their businesses and make appropriate connections. That's kind of a a new phrase. I haven't heard that. You You haven't heard that term. So a cohort is really a group of companies that come together almost like a class of students who are going through or moving through a particular program. So our cohorts run for about three months. They come in every other Friday, and we help these CEOs look at their business model, look at how they're able to pitch their businesses. And in fact, I think I'm going to recommend and have recommended to some of them that they apply to be on this particular program pitching their businesses. We help them with connections, strategic connections, because we know that there is so much noise in the ecosystem. If you are a hospital or an insurance company and you're looking for new innovations, sometimes as a large corporation, it's hard to find the innovation because if you said, I'm looking for patient engagement technology, you could be deluged with innovations, some of which the companies aren't really ready to be able to implement in your hospital system, some of which may not even really be patient engagement, but they, but they want to talk to you. And so part of what we do is help filter, and another word we like to use, Richard and Elizabeth, is the word curate. We're able to curate the entrepreneurs, almost like curation at a museum, so that when the large corporates are looking for these innovations, we can give them companies that we think are really best going to match their needs. That's a fantastic program. It's really great that you're connecting entrepreneurs with innovation to companies that are seeking innovation. So how long has NJIT been doing this type of program? Is it relatively new? So this particular program, Health IT Connections, is a five-year-old program. But NJIT has been working with entrepreneurs for 30 years. NJIT established the state's, New Jersey's, oldest and largest tech and life sciences incubator, the Enterprise Development Center, 30 years ago. And we knew that by bringing entrepreneurs together, having them sit together in physical space where they could collide with like-minded individuals would help them grow their businesses. So they could ask each other, who have you used for marketing assistance? Who's been able to help you with intellectual property? And we know who some of the answers to that are. And Absolutely. In fact, and in fact, I believe, Richard, at one point, you, when you were starting your business, you uh, hung your shingle out in our uh, business incubator. Yeah, I have to just jump in here and say that NJIT was a absolutely wonderful organization and helped us start the law firm in so many ways. One of the ways was just even learning about how entrepreneurism works. If you're coming from a corporate background like I did, Really, the entrepreneurial world is quite a bit different than the corporate world. And so I got a great education. I met a lot of great people. Hopefully some clients. And uh, we (laughs) still have many, many clients from the NJIT incubator. And it's really a source of satisfaction for me to see how well some of them have done. There's a lot of success stories that came out of that organization. 
and a lot of our clients have been successful too. So it really did help give Gearheart Law a great boost and a great step forward. So there's so. a success story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And in fact, the NGIT Incubator is itself undergoing a transformation. We have rebranded it as an organization called VentureLink, and we're putting some additional funding into the actual physical facilities to make some modernization so that our main conference room, which you may recall, was up on the fourth floor. We're going to actually get that finally down to the first floor and do some other uh, wonderful things at the facility. We also have a lot of students who are now really interested, students and faculty who are very much interested in starting up businesses, and we've got some new programs that the university and NJI are able to do to help students and faculty bring forward these commercialization ideas that they have. So, Judith, if I'm on the outside and I haven't gone to NJIT and I don't, maybe I haven't even met you. And What, I, you haven't met me? <laughs> I'm pretending. <laughs> <laughs> but if I, if I was that person. Once you meet Judith, you never forget. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then what's the first step? Like, what would I do? Is there an application form to fill out to get into your program? How do I do that? Again, a lot of times we like to talk to people directly to kind of figure out what makes sense. For the Health IT Connections program, we have an application. There's applications to join the VentureLink uh, facility as well. But we like to talk to people to figure out where are they as an entrepreneur and what might we recommend as the right next step for them to take. Because there's a lot of wonderful resources within the state of New Jersey and the overall entrepreneurial ecosystem. So a lot of times when I'm talking to entrepreneurs, I'll say, have you gone to any of the local meetups? Because there are wonderful meetups around the state. Up in Hoboken, there's a New Jersey Tech meetup that Aaron Price had started. There's meetups at Fairleigh Dickinson University. And I know, Elizabeth, you had been very involved with the Morris Tech meetup. There's some down in Princeton and in South Jersey. And it's a way to, again, start meeting other entrepreneurs, other service providers, other people to kind of help you figure out what you want to do next. You don't have to go it alone. And I have to say, having that support really makes a big difference because you meet a lot of people who are in the same boat, trying to do sort of the same thing that you're trying to do. You can share war stories, you can share resources, and it's a great boost because lots of times if you're out there being the lone entrepreneur, you're on your own, and you really don't have a place to share your experiences. And the incubators and the meetups are fantastic places to do that. Exactly. Additionally, there's some state resources and federal resources that sometimes people are not even aware of. The Small Business Development Centers, which are funded by the SBA, have resources in all of the counties. And in New Jersey, they're affiliated with Rutgers University, and sometimes they're also located at the community colleges. And they'll put on courses to, again, help an entrepreneur gain a particular skill, whether it might be a marketing opportunity or how to use QuickBooks or some activity to really help them move their businesses forward. There's also a Women's Center for Entrepreneurship Corporation. I think Alice Hackett, who's our board chair from WCEC, was on this program a couple of weeks ago talking about the resources that they provide. And even though that organization is called the Women's Center, it's for anybody. But that's the particular SBA program. We also have a program at NJIT called Procurement Technical Assistance. And this program has been funded by the Department of Defense, and we help small businesses sell goods and services to the federal government. And the federal government buys a lot of things. They buy clothing for the fighting force. They buy weapons, but they also buy training, food service, cleaning, marketing, a whole range and set of capabilities. And so our PTAC organization helps these small businesses make those linkages and get connected to who's buying what from the federal government. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. Our special guest this evening is Judith Chef, and we'll be right back after this message. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gerhardt Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gerhardt Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection.
Corporation, licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And our special guest, Judith Schaff. But before we get rolling again with Judith, I have to say something about her. She doesn't Uh (laughs) brag. Judith never (laughs) brags about this, but she should and she could. And I'm not sure how many people realize this, but Judith has a bachelor's and a master's degree in math. From the University of Illinois, but that math. Will, math. Wow. Yeah. yeah, you must be really smart. So, so <laughs> girls can do math, okay. but that wasn't enough. So then she went to the Wharton School of Business, which you know is so easy to get into, not, <laughs> and got an MBA in international business from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. So I didn't I, know that about you. I've known Judith for a long time. Yeah, I didn't we have. know that. We had some questions come up. We're really interested in the different types of financing that are available for scaling a business. So it's it's not just investor financing, right? Right. And But before we get to the financing question, one thing I do want to mention to entrepreneurs is if you are thinking of doing government business, whether it's a county government, state government, doing business, perhaps selling your product to a university who might be a state entity or the federal government, there's certain registrations and certifications that you need to do just in order to be able to be on their list of approved vendors. And so I'm always encouraging entrepreneurs to get registered in something called the SAM system, which is for the federal government, to again take a look at in the state of New Jersey. We, as a university, cannot pay someone unless they have a business registration certificate from the state of New Jersey. It doesn't cost them anything to get the BRC certificate, but it's just some of the processes of doing business. So when you're thinking about scaling your business, you need to be sure you know what are all of the elements that you need to get in place. And some of these processes and certifications. I'm always telling people it's not as quick as buying something on the internet where you set up your account and 30 seconds later you've pumped in your credit card number and the next day your your goods and services show up. Some of these things take and can take a few weeks to potentially a month or so to get yourself registered. So that's important to understand where are you targeting and what do you need to have in place to be able to go after those things. So given that, is it make more sense for the entrepreneur who wants to do a contract with the government to find that contract first and then go through this registration process? Or should they do the registration process first and then go searching? I for would the do contract? the registration first and then and then go searching for those items. So Judith, if somebody's listening to this and they want to ask you more about that, I want to slip this in. What's the best way to get a hold of you? So the, probably the easiest way to get a hold of me is through email, and it's my last name, S-H-E-F-T, at N-J-I-T dot E-D-U. Now, you were also asking questions about the money, because everybody always wants to know about where's their money to grow my business. So one thing for companies that are in the technology space is a program called S-B-I-R-S-T-T-R. And these are grants from the federal government to help a company develop a particular product or service that meets a particular need that the government has. And they have a whole set of solicitations out for what they're willing to pay to have you develop. And the great thing about these programs, and this gets back to the intellectual property, is that while the government is giving you grants to do this development, all of the intellectual property is owned by the small business. It's not owned by the government. So it's not giving up any of your intellectual property rights to get your product developed. In addition to that, these are grants, not loans, right? Right, So the the government doesn't take any part of your company. Right. They're not supervising you. So it's a great deal if you can get it. It's a great deal if you can get it. And again, there's resources around the country that are, if you just kind of Google SBIR experts that should be able to provide some assistance to small businesses. The federal government this year is doing a roadshow tour where the SBIR agencies are visiting different states uh, to have agency representatives talk about the program. In New Jersey on September 18th 
It's going to be held at one of the Rutgers University locations. If you just Google SBIR Roadshow, you can find the New Jersey information. Wow. I would encourage anybody who's starting a business and wants some money and really wants to know what people want to buy, too, because they kind of give you guidance on what you should be making, right? Yes, certainly in terms of what the federal government is looking to buy. And remember, the federal government is everything from military to veterans administrations to schools. So Department of Agriculture, Environmental Protection, so it covers a, a wide swath of activity. But people are sometimes also very interested in, I need cash. And I need it now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I know that feeling. When the bills come in. So there's a number of organizations in New Jersey that are able to help businesses get access to funding. As you mentioned in the introduction, I'm uh, the chairwoman of an organization called Greater Newark Enterprise. Corporation, and it's essentially a micro loan organization which will provide funding to small businesses up to about $50,000. And we connect them not only to ourselves, but to then some of the local banks who might be able to add in additional funding. And one of the great things about GNEC is it's not just giving you loans, it's also providing technical assistance because we know if we don't help the entrepreneur with some of the skills that they need to be successful, they're not going to necessarily be successful in paying the loans back to us. And so we, as essentially a community development fund, CDFI, need to get the funds repaid back in order to roll them into other projects. And so technical assistance kind of goes hand in hand with what we do at GNEC. Do they have to report to you on a regular basis about what they're doing with the money? I mean, they can't just take it and have a big party in Cancun. Right, <laughs> right. There are reports that they need to provide, and there, there needs to be a payback schedule that's agreed upon at the start of the project. We have a loan review committee that looks at the application very much as if you were applying to a bank as well. What kind of criteria are used by your organization to select the projects? So again, we're going to look at what exactly is the entrepreneur doing. We have a mission to try to help promote community activities, low moderate income entrepreneurs, as well as trying to ensure that as we look at the loan application, that they've got the ability to repay it, that we think that the market that they're going after is something that they're going to be able to repay and that if, unfortunately, they run into trouble, what are the assets that we'll be able to get a hold of, uh, you know, should they not uh, necessarily be successful? As I said, these are not huge amounts of money. $50,000 isn't going to be perhaps as much as you need for some of the things that you need to do, which is then why entrepreneurs are going to look to other potential resources within the state, whether it's angel investors or venture capitalists who might fund a piece of their business. So what are the differences between angel investors and venture capitalists? So an angel investor is really an individual who is investing his or her own money in a business and getting a piece of equity in return. A venture capitalist is generally someone who's investing other people's money into investment opportunities. And the venture capitalist make some of their money by getting a return off of what the investment provides back to the investors. Typically, you might think that angel investors come in earlier and then a venture capitalist will come in a little bit later. So, Judith, what are these investors looking for when somebody's giving their presentation? What kind of makes them say, okay, I will invest in that person? Really, what any investor wants to know is, am I going to get my money back? Which means they want to understand not how wonderful the technology is, because we're going to assume that the technology you've got works. They want to know, is there a big enough market out there? Are there enough people going to want to buy the product or service that they're going to be able to see a great return from the investment that they make in your business? Judith, you're a wealth of information. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. We'll be back for our pitch contestants right after this message. Judith, I hope you stay with us. Absolutely. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearhart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at Gearhart 
GearHeartLaw.com. At GearHeart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at GearHeart Law. www.GearHeartLaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact GearHeart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And our special guest, Judith Shaft. And we're going to be starting the pitch portion of our show in just a minute. But before we start, some vital info. Listeners, when you're listening to the pitches, please think about which one you like best and go to the Passage to Profit page on the Gearhart Law website. And you need to scroll down to find the poll to vote. And the website is Gearhart Law. G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W. Everybody gets one vote, and the voting is open for one week. Don't forget to like us, too, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And get your friends to vote. And you can remember the name of the show by imagining you're walking down a passage with a huge pot of gold at the end. Passage to profit. And may your passage be short and your profit be huge. Each contestant now gets two minutes to pitch, followed by a discussion with our guests. The overall best vote getter gets a professionally produced video for their pitch, a $500 value. And the winning pitch goes on to our YouTube channel. So let's get started. We have Brett Newman here from Ohio who just found out his flight back got canceled. Oh, no. <laughs> but he's, he's gonna, so we have plenty of time. <laughs> he's going to pair through and give his pitch. Welcome, Brett. Yeah, I won't mention any airlines, but I won't fly with them again. <laughs> So you've got two minutes. Go. Everybody loves their flash screen TV, but the sound is deplorable. So with the sound wave bouncing all over the room aimlessly, the solution is here. I call it the Soundbird of Turbo Scoops. For only $19.99, you can simply have better sound. Using reflective technology, this device cups your down-firing speaker on your TV and enhances your sound to where you can lower the volume, stop all this aimlessly bouncing waves all over your room at soundverter.com or even now on amazon.com. Get your set today. You'll be glad you did. <laughs> so I went to your website before I met you and watched the video after we'd spoken on the phone. And the video really shows how the sound is different. So I actually went online and bought two of them off your website. Awesome. Yeah, so I think they really work. Well, if you go to the website and you'll see the testimonials, these are actual people that's purchased this. Uh, this is a grassroots operation. Uh, I'm an American vet, and one says need to bring that up. And uh, even the Amazon has really awesome reviews. So Judith has a question. Yeah, I wanted to ask, because one, one of the things that's frequently important is, where is your product manufactured? Olin Plastics, Canal Winchester, Ohio. So it's a U.S.-made product, and the CEO of the business is a veteran. So there may be some resources that are specifically targeted towards veteran entrepreneurs and certainly there's a market for products that are made in the u.s awesome yeah the uh even the mold base what they call mold base because this is an injected molded product was created and built machine here in the united states that's so, fabulous so why did you pick the u.s over some other country i just wanted and i've heard it time and time again china you know china you know korea whatever I'm like, I'm going to try to do this here and accomplish this there. And I, I just thank my lucky stores, God Almighty, that I was able to accomplish it by networking in my hometown with people I knew. Again, and the fortunate side of this is I know not everybody has this networking in their arena, you know, because I just fortunately went to a friend of mine who owned a body shop, said, you want to invest? Um, next thing I know, a friend of his was showing up and, uh, he was telling him how the product worked, and then he handed me a card, and the rest is history. And Mr. Bruce Weeks, you know, basically helped me, and we bartered this. The, all these steps have been bartered as far as me helping them and them helping me get the mold base completed. That's a $50,000 project in itself. So I, I'm really interested in hearing about how you created this product, Bartering for Services. That's pretty unusual. But before we get there... 
tell me, how does the product actually work? Since we're on the radio and we don't have a picture in front of us, you said that there's a, a plastic mold that attaches to the back of the TV. So how does it attach to the TV? And is there something coming out from the bottom of the TV? Absolutely. And, and plain and simple. Uh, and everyone's probably done this one time or another and seen it on YouTube or whatever, where someone takes a bowl, takes a phone, turns on their music, and sticks it in the bowl. That's reflective technology. It's been used for years uh, in amphitheaters on instruments, just reflecting that sound wave. It's known as an airwave. If you redirect that sound wave to you, to the audience, you're going to hear it clear, better, so on and so forth. So All, what is the, the majority of your flat screen TVs have what they call a down firing speaker. What this means is the speaker is on the very bottom side of your TV facing the ground. So what does the product look like then? Basically a cup shape. Uh, it has a vertical and horizontal tab that can be mounted because uh, the TV manufacturers vary on where their speaker placement is. So when I created it, I created it in a universal way that if the speaker was offset from the rear of the mold, you know, of the TV casing, chassis, if you want to refer to it as that way, uh, you could snap off the vertical tab and just use the horizontal tabs to use this to cup over your speaker. Well, and is, is this something that someone like my grandmother is going to be able to do, or are we going to have to be calling a, a helpline to, to get it installed? Oh, simple, easy to install, peel and stick operation. Uh, I went with that just to make it easy for anybody to install and of course keep costs down because i could have come up with some fancy clamp ideas and mm. this that and the other and i thought you know if it's going to sell to the masses got to keep it cheap and so what does it retail for 19.99 all right shipping and handling free right now on amazon and soundburners.com that sounds great and so do i need less volume control then with my tv if i have these what most people I've heard back is the fact some have returned their sound bar after purchasing these. The other side of the coin is you don't need a secondary volume control. But yes, you'll end up lowering your volume to your TV due to the fact that now you are pushing the sound wave towards you, redirecting it towards you instead of bouncing all over your room. Uh, you can look it up on the internet what secondary sound waves they're doing, but uh, just imagine uh, shooting a tennis ball at the ground and where your TV is, it's going to bounce all over that room. It may not even hit you, but fly right on past you. So do you think the clarity improvement, because that's really what I saw or heard, excuse me, on your website, and that was surprising, because you're not distorting the sound by bouncing off different things, and maybe a little bit of the wave gets diffused into the sofa or what, you know? Absolutely. Not only is it getting distorted, it's getting diffused. You've got carpet, that's a diffusion, that absorbs the sound wave and just eats it up. Uh, you got your deflection taking place, okay? And then with all that happening taking place, what we naturally do is crank up the volume. <laughs> yes, we and do. And we annoy everybody <laughs> so that we can hear it clearly or hear what was that they said. So, yes, once these are put on TV, all that goes away, and you'll find yourself lowering the volume. Uh, my son one day said, I have the volume set at 4 listening to it at 10 feet away dad wow. now of course <laughs> ear health helps too <laughs> <laughs> but uh i used to listen to my volume and my tv at anywhere from 30 to 60 to hear what was being said to hear the dialogue i now listen it to it the volume level and again 55 inch screen tv 10 feet away i'm at um, eight and the volume level and have to bring it down to six when a commercial comes on or i'll mute it because it's, it seems too loud. It's yeah, like, oh. if you could invent something that moots commercials <laughs> automatically and turns it, uh, you would become a billionaire. I just want to, uh, for your next product line. That's what I'm going to work on. <laughs> I think I saw on your website, too, that you don't lose as much sound through the back. So, like, if you're living in an apartment, right. the person on the other side of the wall doesn't get as much noise. I've had customers respond mm -hmm. that had TVs there in their living room, and right behind the living room is their bedroom wall. You know, or the bedroom and their beds back there. And they said when they installed them, they noticed that they wasn't disturbed by the sound because they were able to lower the sound and the sound wave was not reverberating inside that bedroom. How sales been? Uh, sales have been good. I've sold over $30,000 in volume. That's great. Uh, I uh, am working on, well, I have a, a little radio commercial I brought 
with me on my little flash drive and kind of what I just said to you basically goes, we all love our flash screen TVs, but the sound is deplorable, you know. But now the solution is here, Turbo Scoops. And it's very economical. I confess, uh, I have a treadmill and I put it in front of the TV and with the treadmill running, it's really hard to hear the television. I have to turn the volume way up and I've tried things like headphones and I think about getting speakers. I'm going to get a pair of these. No, I already bought you a she, pair. Is that why you yes. got them for me? Oh, yeah. yeah. You I are got so one awesome. for the main room and one for the basement workout room. That's fantastic. So I'll try them. We'll awesome. have you back for a testimonial. Sounds and good. I'll fly I'm, my own I'm, plane next time. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a question. You're building this. Do you want to keep it or, or do you want to sell it eventually? You know, everything in the United States is for sale, including this. <laughs> <laughs> the right price will buy anything. So you have a patent on this, right? It is patented. I, I have the um, the utility patent on it and uh, the design patent is That's great. completed here in the next should be approved, and I should be hearing something back this summer. And you were telling us before the show that you had submitted your idea to a big box store. Tell yes. us what happened there. Well, that's what people need to be leery about this, and, and I'm sure a lot of inventors are leery about talking about their idea to someone else, figuring someone will take off with it. It would be long story short. I had coming up just throwing names out. Soundverter was a name I when I was creating this. I wanted to create everything. And the name even was created by me, Sound Verter. And I looked up, Verter was to pour out. Sound is, you know, sound. We know is sound. So it sound appropriate for me. So anyhow, with that in mind, I had bought other domains. Sound Scoops was one of them, dot com. Well, before a year went by, I come across uh, this box store saying, you know, bring your box or your idea to the managers of the store and they like it and they put it on the shelves. Then maybe we can take you nationwide. Well, I approached that, and my mistake was not bringing an NDA with me, which is a non-disclosure agreement. Ah, so lesson to those listeners who are out shopping their products around, get an NDA with whoever you speak with. Yes. So anyhow, long story short, the gentleman was supposed to get back with me. You know, take it home, put it on his TV, get back with a couple of days. These are prototypes, and this was just in the very beginning. The patent was actually in the pending process. And uh, the three weeks went by. I never heard back from this guy. Went back. He lost him. Couldn't find him. Blah, blah, blah. So then a year went by, and all of a sudden I get a phone call. Go, Daddy. Someone wanted to buy my Sound Scoops name, domain. I said, hmm, this seems kind of strange. What could this bell be about? Who would want Sound Scoops? So lo and behold, it was soon after that I seen it come out on Kickstarter. It was an very inferior product. But I can only think that this manager – connected with his buddy that was in the marketing and said, I think we got something here. You know, obviously you're not going to be able to match it, but if you can come up something close to it, we might be on to something big here. But the good thing is I, I see it failing. It's closing down. It's They tried to trump the market, which my friend Bruce Weeks said. He said, the problem with this idea, someone's going to try to copycat this right. and rush the market with an inferior product. Sure enough, somebody did. And so if you have an NDA in those circumstances, then you can at least try to rely on the NDA to stop them from doing what they did. But you're not alone. Uh, lots of people are anxious to get their products out there. Sometimes they're dealing with people who don't want to sign NDAs. Then I guess you have to make a decision and about whether it's worth the risk to do it or not. But it's a great story. And the even better part of that is that it didn't stop you, that you were able to move forward successfully and knock the competition out of the water, right? So Hey, McDonald's and Burger King has competition. Everybody's yeah, everybody. got it. <laughs> so, so, Richard, yeah. can you explain exactly what an NDA is and kind of how it works? Sure. A non-disclosure agreement, it's a contract between two people. And most of the time, there's an agreement to keep the information exchanged confidential. And that's basically what it is. Is. There's some exceptions in most agreements for information that is already in the public domain through no fault of the third party. They usually have a term on it, but it's basically an agreement to make sure that whatever is told or whatever information is exchanged between the parties, that they agree to keep it secret and not let it go outside their organization. And, you know, it has legal consequences if the agreement is breached. But it also makes both people signing the agreement aware that this is confidential information. So it kind of heightens the attention that the parties give to keeping the information secret, hopefully. So, so, so I'd like to just make one comment about non-disclosure agreements because we also use them 
from a university perspective as well. And what I advise people is even when you have a non-disclosure agreement, that doesn't mean you need to tell absolutely everything. Hallelujah. What is, <laughs> what is the least amount of information that you need to share confidentially with the other party to achieve a particular objective? Because you don't yet know that you're getting married. You don't yet know that potentially you're going to be doing a joint sales agreement or a joint development agreement. So exchange the least amount of information necessary to get to that decision point. That's great advice, and I couldn't agree more. I think an NDA can help protect the information, but if you don't tell them the information in the first place, they don't know it, and that can sometimes be the safest way to go. So, And I think that people sometimes call these other things, like a secrecy agreement or a confidentiality agreement. Right. Those are the same thing as an NDA? Yeah, those are all interchangeable terms. It just depends on who's creating the agreement and what people are used to saying. Well, I may look up Adam, your next guest coming up, and talk to him about this licensing <laughs> because <laughs> that way, that, you know, that takes a lot of the expense and your adventure and where you're heading, and you, you have protection there by working with somebody. Obviously, you're doing uh, non-disclosure agreements and stuff like that, but you know, if you got a thousand in your kitty, so to speak, you know, if someone runs up with one of them, it's not, it's not going to hurt you. <laughs> so if you sell this and you're done with it, let's say, what's your next step? You can invent something else. Oh yeah. I've got a slew of them <laughs> in my stocking. <laughs> so to speak. Just don't the divulge them yet on the radio. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> right. I, I, I won't. And, and I'll tell you a funny thing. I was working with some guys the other day and I seen it in this invention. Uh, someone bought it for me. I tried it out and said, that's kind of cool, but I could come up with something better for that. And said something to the guy. He says, I like that idea, Brett. Uh-oh, <laughs> no. so, so once an inventor, always an inventor. Yes. Brett, really great to have you on. Where can our listeners find your product again? Be soundverter.com um, or amazon.com and TV sound enhancer, TV sound reflector, sound bar alternative. That sounds great. Thanks so much for being on the show. We really appreciate your story and we wish you all the success. So you're listening to Passage to Profit. If you've just tuned in, we'll be right back with our second pitch right after this message. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years, hundreds of products later and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world, QVC, HSN, Evine Live, and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me, Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventing a toz.com inventing a to z.com email me lisa at inventing a to z.com treat yourself to a day chock full of networking education music shopping and fun go to my website inventing a toz.com now back to passage to profit once again richard and elizabeth gearhart welcome back listeners we're at the second pitch of the evening and joining us now is adam berg with results through focus adam you have two minutes go Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here on iHeartRadio's Passage to Profit. I'm Adam Berg, the author of Sales Decoded, a book, and host of Sales Decoded Live, a sales and effort coaching seminar. Sales Decoded is unlike any other book on sales that anyone has ever seen because it's based on real-time examination of conversations that you have with people that you're selling to. It's based for everybody because everyone sells everything to everyone all the time, whether they know it or not. I made my first sale when I was 12 years old, loved it, and never looked back. I've been in the sales business one way or the other all my life and decided that I would write this book based on the school of hard knocks. Everything that's in Sales Decoded can't be found anywhere else because it comes directly from me. The Sales Decoded Live seminar and effort coaching is based on an inspiration I saw on television when on a sports show a coach said he could not coach effort. He could coach talent and he could coach skills, but he could not coach effort. And I took silent note of that and said, well, I've been working in sales all my life and I know I can coach effort because everyone sells to everybody all the time. The seminar is based on the book itself. 
The book is based into five sections, the things that you hear in the five sections of sales, which is cold calling, prospecting, getting the meeting, negotiating, and closing. And the four sections of the seminar are perspective, basics, what does it mean when, and tradecraft. The book is copywritten and currently under representation by a well-known literary agent. If you'd like to learn more about the book, contact me through my email. And if you'd like me to come speak to you personally about your sales efforts, your company, or your group, you can reach me at resultstf at gmail.com. The name of my company is Results Through Focus, LLC, and the email is resultstf at gmail.com. I am also on LinkedIn under Adam Berg. So, Adam, I have a question. Where are your seminars? Do you go in person? Are they online? I go in person. And where do you hold them then? I have done one. I just got this started. So this is very opportune to be with you kind folks on the iHeartRadio's Passage to Profit radio show. I just completed my first engagement at the Metro North Y in Wayne, New Jersey. And based on that success, I was able to book another presentation at the Fairlawn, New Jersey Library on October 2nd. I am also soliciting uh, major cruise lines to be an enrichment guest and have also solicited businesses in the area that I know have sales forces. Is there a particular industry sector that you think your techniques are most appropriate for, or does it work for whether you're selling to a consumer in a department store, uh, someone who's buying an automobile, or a business-to-business transaction? Excellent question, and I'll start with my first thought when I wrote this book. It's for junior salespeople, ideally working in a bullpen, that are engaged in selling for financial services, telemarketing, which I've also done. I've done that at night. And for people who want to hone their sales skills getting right out of the box when they are engaged in sales, they don't know a lot about it, and they're going to hear... 10 things, nine times out of 10 in these five sections. So each section of the book deals with things that you're going to hear from people like, I don't have enough money, let me run it up the flagpole, all the euphemisms and pedantic talk that people use to either deflect or get you off the phone. But on thorough examination of this book after it was done and submitted and accepted by my agent, it's also for consummate pros people who have been at sales forever, because any consummate pro in sports or in the performing arts will tell you that they go back to 101, acting 101, training camp 101, and they relive their skills. They have to hone them all the time. And if you're doing any kind of sport, you always go back to the basics. I happen to be a fencer, and I always have to practice my footwork because everything starts with footwork. Also, Finally, to answer that question, you're never as smart as you think you are. (laughs) Always (laughs) go back to the basics. And that's what the book is about. Sales Decoded Live puts the book in the center of the one-hour presentation, which can be scaled down to 45 minutes or up to 90 minutes, depending on what somebody wants. So do you also do then some role-playing where you have participants in the seminar attempting to sell to each other and you're able to point out mistakes or learning moments in the uh, transactions? No, I hate that. It interrupts. <laughs> I have, I, okay. Judy, Judy, uh, 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 Tell us how you really feel. Uh, Mr. Berg, yes, please beat around the bush. <laughs> the, the reason for that is I have been in every kind of brainstorming meeting you can possibly shake a stick at. I have done role playing. And the problem with role playing is, is that people are not acting in situ. They are acting for the acting. You're not really getting the results that you want. They're very self-conscious. And I don't believe in role-playing at all. When you're on the line, when everything is on the line, and you're on that phone with that person, there is no time for role-playing. There are no second takes. Uh, You can't do it over. That person's going to ask you a question, and you're going to have just a couple of seconds to react. So role-playing is something I don't engage in. And I like people to learn on their own time anyway. I'm happy to come and discuss anything that's on their mind. 
But role playing is a way of actually avoiding the real issues. I think a good entrepreneur has to have at least some small piece of sales skills. And I think they do even better if they have better sales skills. So what are a few tips that you could give to entrepreneurs who maybe aren't professional salespeople, but they do have to convince an awful lot of people of an awful lot of things a lot of the time? Happy to uh, answer that question with the obvious. First, speak slowly. When people are selling, they believe they're not worth anything, and I'll get to that point later on. But speak slowly. One of the best ways to learn how to speak slowly is to listen to national public radio. In fact, there's a thing called NPR speak. Or if, passage to profit. Or passage to profit. And people who are professional communicators on media speak at about 66% speed of normal speech. In fact, you're listening to it now. And the reason for that is your tongue, your mouth, and your jaw and your lips can't get around the words in verbal communication on the phone unless you give them time to get around. For anybody who golfs, you know you're told not to swing fast. It's not how fast you speak. It's how well you speak. That's the first thing. The second thing is get right to the point. Tell the person what you want and how much you want it for. And the third thing is never waste their time. Those are great tips. Yeah, what are you selling? I might buy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now. I think it's seminars. Yeah, <laughs> seminars. I should probably right, do that. Right actually. now I'm I'm selling me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but let's get back to your seminars then because they do mirror the book. You said they're an hour and a half long? No, it can no? be 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Easily fits into somebody's day. Absolutely. And then what day of the week is it? Is it can be, please, somebody email me and ask me, to come do my seminar, and I will fit it into your schedule. Oh, because you're such a good salesman. Well, <laughs> And that's what you have to do, right? I'll, I'll, you know who was a great salesman? I'll tell you. Richard Nixon was a great salesman. He so, said something I always live by, which is, if I ask and they say no, I never ask again. So if somebody wants me to be someplace, unless there's some absolute reason I can't be there, I say yes. In fact, that's one of the things, that's how you get a meeting in my section on how to get the meeting. If somebody needs you to be at a certain spot on a certain day at a certain time, just say yes. And if you wanted to get a meeting and people were reluctant to give you a time, say, it's not going to cost you anything to see me or talk to me. If you could open the door and I could be right there, what time and what day would it be? And they would say, well, Mr. Burke, could you be here at 10 o'clock on Tuesday? Yes. I can. Now they have no reason to say no. And back to your other point, never give somebody a reason to say no. Your first answer is always the honest answer. So if you're not prepared to be compliant with your prospect or with your future customer, you will not make the sale. So these are things that I really have never heard about selling before, and I've listened to a lot of people talk about selling. This is very valuable information. So are you saying to me right now, let's say we wanted the law firm, five people in the law firm to go to your seminar, or you would even bring it and do it in the law firm for us for 45 minutes? You're looking at the seminar. Uh, it's all in my head. You can't read this anywhere. It's not online. It's not on YouTube. It's a PowerPoint presentation and me. And the PowerPoint presentation is written in such a way is that if you were simply to look at the slides, they would make no sense. I don't read the seminar. I don't read the PowerPoint. I am foreground. It is background. So you will see a series of disparate words or phrases up on each slide, and then I weave them together into a story. Uh, I can provide you with, with, uh, with testimonials uh, about my work where I'm an engaging and uh, lively personality. I discuss things on a personal uh, basis to, to put things in perspective to people. And that's another thing. In any of the sales books, and I've read countless of them and uh, been to workshops, I've been to everything, nobody ever puts sales in perspective. And while binocular vision puts things in perspective all the time. Perspective as an intellectual pursuit is only about 700 years old. I go into this into my sales seminar uh, on, in, the, in the perspective section, naturally, and it's the difference between medieval art and art after the Middle Ages in that artists of the Renaissance were able to create perspective by focusing a point in space and then drawing lines at disciplined angles from it, and you could make something that looked like 
it would look like in real life. If you look at medieval art, everything is very flat. If you look at Renaissance art, everything is in perspective. All you have to do is look at the top of the Sistine Chapel, and you will see the best example of uh, perspective, in, in my opinion, in art history. So I'd like to make a comment on the three points that you mentioned. I think when we were talking earlier about entrepreneurs looking for money, some of these kinds of comments are also very relevant. As an entrepreneur, when you're talking to investors, you want to speak slowly so they can understand what's the product, the service, what is it that you're doing. Get to the point. Don't beat around the bush with a lot of extraneous details, and don't waste the investor's time. So I think your advice works for people who are selling their businesses to people who they're hoping to get investments from as well. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of time. This is intriguing, like very intriguing. Thank you. So let's say again, it's results. Results, TF, so that's the letter T as in Tom, the letter F as in Frank, at gmail.com. If you'd like to contact me about the book and the way to reach my agent, please contact me there uh, about that. Or if you'd like to discuss Sales Decoded Live, contact me there. Okay, and you're on LinkedIn, too. Yes, Adam Berg on LinkedIn. Okay, well, thank you, Adam. A pleasure. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. It's been a pleasure being here on iHeartRadio's Passage to Profit. On WR710 with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart, our special guest, Judith Sheft, and we're going to break. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearhart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearhart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit GearHeartLaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to Profit. Remember, everyone, to go to the Passage to Profit page at GearHeartLaw.com. G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W and vote for your favorite project. So to summarize, we had Brett Newman with Soundverter, S-O-U-N-D-V-E-R-T-E-R. You can find that at soundverter.com. And our second pitch was Adam Berg with Results Through Focus, and he is training people how to make sales in a different way, and you can email him at resultstf at gmail.com. Now Google Passage to Profit and make your choice. Remember, you can only vote once, and you have until next Sunday at 8 p.m. to vote. Best overall vote getter for the show will receive a professionally produced video of their pitch, a $500 value. Yes, and as I always say before we sign off, thanks you guys for coming into Tribeca and doing this with us. We just love hearing this every week. It's like a peek into the future. And thanks again to our guest, Judith Sheff, who took us over the top in so many ways. Thank you, Judith. Do you have any final words for our audience? Well, again, Richard and Elizabeth, thank you for having me on the show, Passage to Profit. I guess my one last piece of advice to people is just jump into the New Jersey entrepreneurial ecosystem, participate in activities, and start making those connections to move your business forward to grow and scale. Excellent advice. And how can people find you again? They can reach me at my email, which is my last name, Sheft, S-H-E-F-T, at N-J-I-T dot E-D-U, or they can find information on the New Jersey Innovation website, njii.com. Perfect. So we have a few more thank yous. Our wonderful media maven, Kenya Gibson. Our scrumptious producer, Noah Fleischman. Our incredible engineer, Rob Barretts. And the whole iHeart team. Thank you. And don't forget to join us next week, listeners, for another excellent speaker and another round of pitches. And you can start thinking about what your pitch will be. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gerhart from Gerhart Law on iHeart with Passage to Profit, WOR710, the voice of New York. May your passage be short and your profit be huge. 